Hello and welcome to Talking Business with Beverly. I am your host, Beverly Wachthauer. Thank you so much for joining me as we talk about how to support entrepreneurs and getting the clarity that they need in creating the time and financial freedom that they desire. And how we do that is not only by addressing your business needs, but also the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and financial needs as well. And on this episode, we have the amazing Natalie joining us today. And she's actually going to talk to us more about the mental and the emotional aspect uh, of being an entrepreneur. And so once again, Thank you so much, Natalie, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Beverly. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, tell our viewers just a little bit more about yourself. Um, well, let's see. So my name is Natalie Ellis. I have a private practice in the Atlanta area, in Decatur, Georgia, specifically, um, where I've been in private practice for the last um, about six years now. So I've been an entrepreneur for the last six years. Um, so about 20 years ago, I got my master's degree from Georgia State um, well, I got my bachelor's at Georgia State and my master's at Argus University. And my master's in, is in counseling. And during that time, just um, getting more experience and getting my license in the mental health field, and I've just enjoyed it. So in my practice, I work a lot with kids as young as three to adults as old as, or as young as 70. Um, and in my work, I do work a lot with individuals, um, with families, as well as with couples, and just helping them enrich their mental health. My business is called Esteem Counseling, and Esteem is about empowering self through enrichment, education, and motivation, and that's the goal in my practice. Awesome, now great. Now, I like to actually ask my guests three random questions before we actually dive in. Are you game? I'm game. Okay, awesome. So, if you could be any animal, what would you be? Wow, any animal. I think um, I'll probably be a bird, a uh -huh. specific type of bird. Maybe, um, um, I'm not really sure what kind of bird. <laughs> well, hey, a bird. a bird that flies. There you go, okay. Something that flies away and could just travel and see everything. So there I'd you say go. a bird. Okay, because there's some birds that don't fly. So you're right, okay. Right that flies. So, <laughs> do you prefer the beach or the mountains? Oh my God, my beach is my happy place. So when I think of visualization, when I'm on that, when I'm, and I'm stressed and I go to my safe place in my head, it's the beach yes. under the sun. Okay, so do you prefer winter, spring, summer, or fall? Well, because I love the beach, I would say summer. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love the sun and being warm. Okay, great. So now we're gonna go ahead and dive on in. So tell me, um, what made you get started in the mental health field? Well, I would say that it seems as if ever since I was a little girl, people have had a tendency to always want to talk to me. Hmm. So I get random people all the time wanting to just kind of talk about um, their experiences or share their most vulnerable experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's been since I was little. And I found myself, I'm the middle child, by the way, and I'm the only girl. So I'm the middle child and the only girl. And my parents, I tend to hear a lot of different things from my parents. So it just felt natural to mm -hmm. go into that field. I tend to um, be a great listener hmm. and be very empathetic okay. to others. So just felt natural to kind of go into the counseling field. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And so um, what are some of the, when it comes to, first of all, mental health, it's such a huge field. Yes. Um, and so what are some of the, I guess, stigma when it comes to mental health? What are some of the stigmas that your clients, when they come into you, they have, sure. or even just in general, when it comes okay. to mental health? Right, I think in general, first of all, people are mis informed and miseducated mm. about what mental health is. Mental health is about taking care of our mind um, in relation to our emotional health. Um, and so this is something we all should do. But many mm -hmm. times when we often think of mental health, we think of the severe or the most extreme, mm -hmm. the schizophrenic, the people who are, um, again, quote unquote crazy, something must be wrong. And so again, people are coming in when, they're at, when they have significant depression or significant anxiety or PTSD or whatever may have gone on in their lives and they're, they're um, um, having certain symptoms, mm -hmm. they're thinking something must be wrong with them. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes the stigma is just that, the shame of, I must be different, something must be wrong, how are people gonna see me? And so that's a lot of what I get when people are coming in and the embarrassment, there's a lot of embarrassment and shame about just having to come in and, and seek help, um, feeling as if they should have been stronger. Um, and so again, these are some of the stigmas that we definitely wanna take away because again, when we need help, needing help doesn't mean you're weak. Mm. Um, it's, 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 with clients, it's really empowering them and helping them identify what are your needs. 
and how do we seek seek the the help and support so that we could accomplish and, and, and get our needs met wow wow oh, yeah. powerful and so i know one area that you work with are children and young adults yes. in your practice mm -hmm. and so um as a parent what are some things that I can do to promote good mental health when it comes to my children or young adults? Sure. One thing I will say as parents, we're the first models for our children. Mm -hmm. We're the first models in every sense. We're their, their first love, we're their first teacher, we're their first everything. And so as parents, if our own mental health is not great, then it does impact our children also. Mm -hmm. So as models, it's important that we, we understand how to um, be aware and, and be self-aware of our own emotional health and how to take care of ourselves because the kids are seeing that. Mm -hmm. Kids kids learn from what they see and what they hear. And so I would say the best thing, the first best thing is to pay attention to our own self mm -hmm. and um, be aware of our own mental health and how to um, seek also seek the help that we need wow. and being able to have those type of communications with our kids. Um, because if, if a child is, is doesn't see that, oh, well, mom doesn't necessarily take care of herself and in, 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 in their eyes, well, that's not what people do. Or if mom kind of um, rejects this notion of mental health or stigmatizes herself, mm -hmm. then the child also learns, oh man, mm, that's not something I could possibly talk to mom or dad about. Um, so again, I would say the first teacher is to be the role model wow. Wow. Um, and get some education ourselves about wow. it. That is great stuff. And so definitely hold on. So we will definitely be back after these messages. Hi, this is Natalie Ellis. One tip that I do have for entrepreneurs, it's about creating and finding balance. And as entrepreneurs, we often find ourselves very focused on our business and achieving success. And balance is making sure that we're taking care of our whole health. And whole health constitutes taking care of our bodies, taking care of our minds. So I strongly recommend that we do that by making sure we eat healthy, we're exercising, we're um, seeking support and seeking help when we need to. And the other thing I want to talk about is a series that I have called Ask the Therapist, which is every Wednesday live on Instagram at 8 p.m. It's Ask the Therapist, where I have topics every Wednesday, different topics in regards to mental health, so people could chime in and join and ask questions about their mental health topics. So that's every Wednesday, Ask the Therapist at 8 p.m. live on Instagram. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to Talk of Business with Beverly. I am your host, Beverly Wathauer. And before the messages, we were speaking with Natalie and she was actually talking to us um, about, you know, as a parent, what can we do to ensure that our children have good mental health? And so my next question to you is, you know, as a parent um, or an adult that's responsible for a child, if I do feel like my child needs some services, like what are my first steps? What do I do to get yeah, them Yeah, definitely. It, definitely having the conversation with the child. It's, you know, one of the things I tell parents is, we know, our, well, the child knows themselves to some extent, but we know our child best. And mm -hmm. so whenever we notice that anything is out of the ordinary, they're sleeping too much, grades are, are falling, um, they're more aggressive, they're, they appear a little bit more sad, they're isolating. If we're noticing difference in behaviors, then yes, definitely approach them, talk to them about what's going on. And sometimes some kids are able to uh, um, express what's going on with them and some aren't, and definitely seeking services. And so. Again, there's, you know, there's lots of um, professional services out there that they can seek in their local area. There's local mental health centers, there's private um, practitioners as well that they can seek. Um, and so a lot of times people are always afraid of medication, psychiatrists, mm -hmm. so there's different levels. So I'm a counselor, which is a master's level, and then there's psychiatrists, which are MDs, they're mm -hmm. doctors. And so not everybody who may exhibit mental health um, symptoms need to have uh, medication so that's a lot of the conversations i do have with parents and their and their the kids about um well let's 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 identify what the issue may be okay. let's process it let's talk about it let's let's develop some some tools some strategies um let's do everything that we can mm -hmm. and if we're noticing you know what there's not a change and this is after a period of time there's not a change well you know what then let's let's say well maybe we may need to look into getting a 
a psychiatric assessment where wow. we need to look into medication. So that's not always the case, mm -hmm. but sometimes mm -hmm. we may have to, to do that as well. Wow, that's good yeah. stuff. And so now, um, my background is in education. I mm -hmm. used to teach. And so what can schools or universities do yeah. to kind of address uh, the issue of mental health and to you know make sure that even the student population, the yes. student body is aware of what's considered good mental health? Definitely, definitely getting more education as to what mental health looks like. Because for kids also, particularly boys, Mm -hmm. It could look like acting out behaviors. And uh -huh. so people go, oh, they're just bad, they're just acting out, but then there could be something deeper than that. And so mm -hmm. it's important to, to communicate with the child. It's important to communicate with the parents. It's important to look at the whole student. So mm -hmm. not just um, a portion of the student, but the whole student. And, and so there's this thing called adverse childhood experiences. It's a study that was done, and they look at these different... Um, different um, experiences that a child may experience, mm -hmm. may go through before the age of 18, such as um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, oh, wow. um, abandonment by a parent. And so, again, the school system just needs to be aware of what mental health looks like mm -hmm. and what um, experiences the kids may go through, because all that could contribute to their behavior and whether or not they're, um, they're misbehaving at school or whether or not they're not performing. One of the things I talk to parents a lot about is, um, you know, a lot of times some kids aren't performing not strictly because um, they don't know what's going on or they, they're not smart enough, but mm -hmm. sometimes, again, there could be depression, mm -hmm. there could be um, a learning dis disability, and so there's a lot of different testing that has to be done, but talking, the parent has to talk to the educators and the school system to kind of figure out, okay, my child is not performing as I know they can, what do we need to do? And some of that could be mental health and some of that could be other things too. Awesome. And so um, do you have the same recommendations if they're at a college or a university level? Because now they're, you know, moving into young adult oh, yeah. and so it's a little bit more Definitely. And interestingly enough, I've had a few um, kids that I've had as they were kids and then they've gone into college and we've used the IEPs too. So college oh. do recognize mm -hmm. IEPs, which are um, individualized education plan. And this is when, you know, when we're noticing that this child... Um, they're smart, they could get the material, so it's not about whether or not they could get the material, mm -hmm. but they need a little bit more support. And due to their mental health, there are um, special education, there are things in place that could give the student and the parents rights in, um, for accommodations. And so mm -hmm. these accommodations could follow them into college as well. Um, and one of the strong things that I tell people too is you have to be an advocate for yourself because no one's really going to know, teachers aren't going to always know, because mm -hmm. there are some students that are very quiet mm -hmm. and, and, and um, follow directions, and so, but then they're still struggling academically. Wow. Um, so, yeah. And so if I am that child or young adult and I do notice that there are some changes, you know, um, how do I know when it's time to actually speak up and say something to someone else? Sure, well, if the minute you notice it, Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because some people aren't, don't even notice it. But mm -hmm. the fact that you're noticing, hmm, something is potentially um, not right, doesn't feel mm -hmm. right. I'm, I'm, I'm sadder than usual or um, I'm getting more upset than usual mm -hmm. or I, I just can't seem to concentrate. I can't seem to think straight. Um, whenever we're noticing anything, it's important to seek help. Um, talk to someone because again you might not know what the issue is, but somebody else could provide some support, could provide some, some information that you just didn't know. So I strongly recommend them and notice that mm -hmm. something's different, seek help and seek support. Awesome. Okay, and so as an adult, and now I'm thinking about children, okay, you know, as an adult, I can make a decision of whether or not I want to seek help. Yes. But if I'm a child, is the parent responsible for saying, hey, I need my child to get a specific type of service? You know, does the child have any say so and say, no, I don't want to do this? So how does that actually work if it's a parent yeah, on behalf yeah. of the child? In interestingly enough, I have a lot of kids who tell their parents, hey, something's not right. Mm. I okay. need to get help. So it's interesting that that happens. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kids do seek help, ask the parents for help, but there are um, parents because of the child's behavior, if they're noticing that the child is acting up, there's a lot of things going on, or they're um, isolating, then yes, the parent um, could say, hey, I need you to, um, we need to go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that does happen too. And at the end of the day, it does become the choice of the child because I do have mm -hmm. kids, if they didn't want to be there, they're not going to talk in the session. Mm. They're not going to talk during the assessment. And so there needs to be some buy-in from the child. And so, you know, my job when the first time anybody comes see me is to first thank you for coming, mm -hmm. you know, to definitely thank them for coming because that takes a big step for one. And then to help to help them notice the importance of this service of recognizing your mental health for not just the moment, but also for the future. 
for them. And so that is one of the things with the kids. I always talk about, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, this is how this process can help you achieve that goal. Um, and so I bring, it, I bring it back to that. Okay, okay. And so we know, you know, just with statistics and data right now that suicide is high among, you know, young adults. And so if I suspect, suspect that my child is having suicidal thoughts or even if I'm that young adult that's experiencing it, that, what are my first steps? What steps should I take? Definitely there's a crisis hotline that individuals could take. There's a suicide hotline they could call. Um, definitely seeking help. So I would not, you know, a lot of times, again, people don't want to burden others with their stuff mm. that they have going on. So these are things that adults were telling me. I was suffering with this, but I didn't want to call anybody. I don't want to tell anyone. And so one of the things when clients are telling me this, we develop a safety plan. We develop a plan. Because, again, more likely if it happened one time, it may occur again. And so at times of, of stress, at times of frustrations, at times of anger, and at times of depression, who can you call? What are the things that we can do? To, what are the things that we can put in place um, to help you in, at those times? And so making a list of people you could call, making a list of things you can do is something that we do, that we, we do during the session. But yeah, definitely seeking help and seeking services. Wow. Oh my gosh. And so um, as I'm listening to you talk about that, um, you know, I guess as a, either a parent or someone that's in the field of education, um, is there, I'm thinking like a checklist, like in my mind, I'm automatically thinking like, what should I be looking for? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm looking for it, am I calling more of that in? But like, is, are there specific behaviors that I should be looking for as an adult? For someone that's, that's suicidal? For, for anyone suicidal or anything dealing with the mental? Yeah, mental. with mental health, um, you know, um, sad mood, okay. isolation, you know, definitely things. Um, when a kid is not um, playing with others and they're isolating, that could potentially be something. First, it's, it's reckon, you know, first we have to take, okay, has this kid, um, is that part of their growing up that they've never really talked to other kids? So mm -hmm. there could be other things, you know, the autism, there's a lot of different things that we could mm -hmm. look at, right? But again, if there's a, a change in, in behavior, a change in emotional um, state, those are the things that we have to pay attention to. S sad mood, um, depression, fear, recent fears, you know, or, you know um, like for example, when we had the school shootings, mm -hmm. during that time, a lot of the schools were doing this um, intruder drill. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, I had a lot of my kids who were coming in with secondary trauma. So that's, there's a secondary trauma. First of all, you're hearing it in the news, so mm -hmm. that's traumatic in itself, just hearing it over and over. And then now the schools are implementing the intruder drill where, you know, let's pretend, you know, there's mm -hmm. an intruder mm -hmm. in the building and what is everybody going to do? And so that, there's already some trauma there that creates secondary trauma. And so, um, so that kid may become a little bit more afraid to go outside. They may, um, more crying spells, you know, may act out more. If there's fighting, there's suspensions. Um, so yeah, any change in their mood, in their behavior, in their actions, in, in their thinking patterns. So these are all the things that we have to pay attention to. Wow, this is great information. And so we will definitely be back right after these messages. Hi, this is Natalie Ellis. One tip that I do have for entrepreneurs, it's about creating and finding balance. And as entrepreneurs, we often find ourselves very focused on our business and achieving success. And balance is making sure that we're taking care of our whole health. And whole health constitutes taking care of our bodies, taking care of our minds. So I strongly recommend that we do that by making sure we eat healthy, we're exercising, we're um, seeking support and seeking help when we need to. And the other thing I want to talk about is a series that I have called Ask the Therapist, which is every Wednesday live on Instagram at 8 p.m. It's Ask the Therapist, where I have topics every Wednesday, different topics in regards to mental health, so people could chime in and join and ask questions about their mental health topics. So that's every Wednesday, Ask the Therapist at 8 p.m. live on Instagram. Thank you.
Welcome back to Talking Business with Beverly, and I am your host, Beverly Wathauer. And we've been speaking with Natalie, and she's been giving us amazing tips, especially when it comes to mental health in our children. And so my next question is, when it comes to the actual treatment uh, of children in mental health, does it mirror uh, what adults get as far as the treatment process? So what does that look like, and how is it different from um, adult treatment? It's different in that with kids, you have to be a lot more physically engaging with them. And oh. so with my, you know, with a lot of my children clients up until the age of 10, I'm mostly on the floor. So we're doing a lot of things on the floor, um, playing games, doing activities. Um, I try to mirror it when we do things in regards to emotion. I'm, 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 showing them a, a math face and then they're showing me their math face back mm -hmm. so we're doing a lot of those type of activities more physical and hands-on activities mm -hmm. with kids and then we're relating it to their emotional health we're we're processing what's going on with them if they're able to to articulate that mm -hmm. because again with kids they're, mm -hmm. they're less articulated than, than the adults and so a lot of the things that we do is through play okay. um, in talking about our emotions is through play and games art I do a lot of art activities with kids, whether it's painting and drawing. And so those are some of the things that we do with kids different than adults. Okay, okay, and I guess that makes sense, you know, because they're more um, the fine motor skills and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, as a parent, what are some things that I can do to actually promote good mental health? So, you know, when it comes to my, my children, what are some activities, things that we can do to just make sure that we're promoting that? Because we know how to promote, like, good physical health, but when it comes to me mental health, how do we actually promote that? Sure. One of the things that I would suggest is important, you know, the old adage about um, eating together for dinner, that's very, very important. One of the things that I see a lot that parents tend to do, which is not helpful for the family structure as a whole, is everybody tends to have their own TVs, everybody's doing their own mm. thing, everybody's in their own room, have their games in their room, TVs in their room, and this happens very young, mm -hmm. and that creates isolation and disconnection in the families. And so it's so important, again, for fam for great mental health, for families to do a lot of things together. Because that's how you get to know your child, mm -hmm. that's how they get to know you. So that's one thing. And then we talked about modeling. So as, as parents, it's important, it's important to model. Model how to um, communicate effectively, model how to express emotions effectively. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I, that I strongly suggest. A third thing that seems to be a big, big deal that I hear a lot, not just from the kid clients, but for the from the adults too, feeling in, not validated. Mm. And so a lot of times kids express themselves and whatever is going on with them um, and parents tend to dismiss it. Mm. Parents tend to dismiss their feelings, tend to dismiss their actions, tend to dismiss the things that they do. And when that happens, that creates a, um, a disconnect in terms of how they see themselves. Um, for example, it's so important to, when a child is telling you that they're feeling this way, rather than say, well, you know what? you're gonna be okay, so don't feel that way, is to really validate their feeling mm -hmm. and to encourage them, definitely, but definitely validate whatever the feeling is because their feeling is their feeling. And so when, when the feeling is dismissed and at that point, then it becomes a question, well, well, should I really feel this way or should I not feel this way? And you don't want, you don't want that child to feel that because then that becomes the norm for them when they're mm -hmm. constantly questioning the feeling. And that creates, again, some mental health issues that I see a lot with adult clients. And so validating children's feelings is very important. Validating the things that they do is important. Um, parents tend to focus on um, the, the bad behavior. So when, when kids act up, we, we make a big deal about that, which to some extent we should. We should definitely recognize it. But when we make a big deal for acting out behaviors and not a, not a big deal for good behaviors, we tend to get more acting out. And mm -hmm. so it's important to Again, when the kids are doing the things that they're supposed to do, to recognize it and to praise it. And that lets them know, oh, they, we want to see more of that. That's mm -hmm. what we want to see more of. But for the child who already may be um, um, having some of their own issues, when we're giving a lot of attention to that negative behavior, then in their mind, this mm -hmm. is what, oh, that's, they pay attention to that a lot. And maybe that's uh -huh. what they want to see more of, whether uh -huh. it's you know, positive or negative attention. And so we don't want to give them that negative attention. Wow, that makes sense. I'm, hey, I'm, <laughs> thank you. And so I know one thing that you mentioned is um, the, the negative behavior, the acting out behavior. So as a parent or an adult working with children, how do I know it's not the normal behavior, especially if they're, sm if they're younger, mm -hmm. like normal behavior mm -hmm. versus if I need to be alarmed and you know, see if there's something that needs to be done additionally? Sure, sure. I think a lot of it is um, follow your gut. You know, mm -hmm. again, you have a lot of parents who say, well, he's, that's just a boy and that's just mm -hmm. how boys act. So there could be some of that too going on. But then again, if that behavior is now impacting their, um, 
church impacting school, then yeah, it could be a boy behavior, but however, this behavior is, is not gonna go well in this environment. And so then that creates a problem. And so one thing I tell parents, yes, it's, 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 we don't wanna definitely um, identify the, the child as being a bad person mm -hmm. or being negative. However, our behavior and our actions, depending on which environment we're in, it may fit, it may not fit. And so sometimes we have to talk about, well, um, let's take the diagnosis of ADHD, because that's a, mm -hmm. I don't want to say a common diagnosis, but that's a very that's a default diagnosis mm -hmm. that, that tends to a lot of kids tend to get because a, a kid who presents depressed could also um, um, a kid who's diagnosed with with ADHD it could yeah. very well be depression it could very well be PTSD trauma stuff but it just kind of looks like ADHD um, and so with with all these behaviors so that kid who presents that way. If they're outside and they're playing and then they're in a smaller school setting, that behavior may not necessarily be an issue. However, mm -hmm. depending on the classroom size, depending on how the teacher um, is teaching in the class, that be their behavior may potentially become a problem. And so there's so many variables that we have to look mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. to determine what's a problem and what isn't. But again, the minute if you feel it in your gut that this is something I need to get looked at, get it looked at. Because there may be a variety of things that we have to, to, um, to change to to um, to adjust in order to make sure that this child is successful in all arenas because right. that's the, ultimately the goal. Right. And that definitely makes sense. And just like you said, working with parents and you know parents being an entrepreneur as well. And so just making sure that we're making sure our family is okay in this arena as we're developing that as well. And so before we wrap up, what would be one piece of advice that you would give? Um, parents or adults, I like to say both, um, that are working with kids and they notice that something is different, like what would be the first step to actually um, addressing to see whether or not it's something more serious? What would be the first, the well, first step? The first step I would suggest is definitely to talk about it. Um, and the other thing that, talk about it, but also talk about it within family members. There's a lot of secrets mm. in families. There's a lot of, um, history in families and so sometimes a child's behavior can be understood when you talk to the grandparent because the grandparent oh so and so had this behavior too and so then that gives understanding that gives some insight because a lot of times people don't want to talk about these things because they feel isolated they feel ashamed they feel embarrassed they feel as if they're the only one who's going through this but when we start talking about it then you could get support because oh yeah, I've experienced that too, and this is what I did. Or so-and-so, you know, your uncle over here, he had some of that, and this is what it was. So I think that's very, very important to do. Definitely seek help and talk to other family members yes. before you get professional help. I like that, looking at the family piece. Mm -hmm. And so um, what's your website and or email address so that our viewers can find out more information about you? Definitely. You could go to my website. Um, it's www.esteemcounselingservices.com esteemcounselingservices.com and my email is info at esteemcounselingservices.com. Awesome, awesome. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today, Natalie. And also I want to thank you guys as my viewers for tuning in. And remember as entrepreneurs, you definitely want to make sure that you're not only addressing your business needs, but also the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and financial needs as well. If you are looking to create that time and financial freedom in your business. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.